We're talking with City of Henderson Mayor Deborah March about the present and future of Henderson. That's next on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt, Cashman Equipment, DeCastro Verde Law Group, Nevada State Bank, Valley Electric Association, and additional supporting sponsors. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this week of Nevada Week. Well, the city of Henderson is the second largest city in our state and rated one of the most livable in the entire country. Henderson tops many of the best city lists and claims numerous community awards for its world-class infrastructure, like its parks and trails. More recently, the city has had some landmark wins at landing big business and industry. A great community and a growing economy mean, mean more people. And yes, Henderson projects more than 100,000 new residents over the next 20 years. So we're sitting down today with the city of Henderson's mayor, Deborah March, to get a better understanding of what goes into bringing big business, like the Raiders, to a city like Henderson. We want to ask questions like, what strategies do you employ to keep the city livable as an influx of new families move in over these next 20 years? And what does the future hold for Henderson and for the mayor herself? I very much welcome you, and thank you so much for being here. I really well, appreciate it. Kip, thank you so much for having me today, and, and I look forward to answering any questions that you or, or your viewers have about the city of Henderson, which is such an amazing city. We have a wonderful quality of life, and it really is a thrill and an honor for me to be here with you. Well, thank you, and let, let's start with that. The, the slogan of Henderson is a place to call home. Yes. So let's say that you have a resident that's moving out from uh, out, out of state or maybe is just looking to relocate within the Las Vegas Valley. Why choose Henderson as their new home? Well, you know, Henderson has a wonderful quality of life. And in fact, um, we, every four years, do a, a survey of our community to find out uh, how much people like our community and, and what they feel about our community. And we have a high level of citizen satisfaction, actually 98% citizen satisfaction, and 94% believe that this is the best place to raise a family. So quality of life is very important to us. We have a park or a trail within a mile of every home, and, and it's a fairly safe community and these are the things that people look to and, and how they can access services and resources and knowing that there's restaurants and opportunities to to engage in the community and I believe Henderson brings a lot of these things to the table and I want to mention that 98 percent too which is 22 points over the average nationally yes. of other cities that are surveyed by the same yes. organization yes. very very impressive and I have to tell you I'm so proud of the employees at the city of Henderson that they really buy into our values We've actually been through developing a comprehensive plan and then strategic planning for the city. And one of the things that, that I take great pride in is, is that all of our employees at the city of Henderson actually carry around this card. It's attached to their ID, and it talks about our, our vision, mission, values, and the priorities of the city of Henderson so that everyone owns that. We all, all our employees from parks and rec workers to police officers to folks across the city that work for Henderson all share those values. And let's, let's talk about those for a sec. I know you have five pillars that the city subscribes mm -hmm. to. C can you list what those p pillars are? Oh, do I have to? No. <laughs> well, education, quality of life, uh, 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 excellent employees, um, uh, economic development, diversity, and, and number one is public safety. Obviously, we need to keep our residents safe in our community. Let's talk a little bit. Well, let's let's actually talk about economic development really quickly. Let's go to if you are a business and you're looking to relocate or you're looking to move into the state from another state, why choose Henderson for your business? You know, I think there's a lot of reasons to choose Henderson. We have a very pro-business attitude. We have a, an educated workforce. Obviously, we, we are always working on that to improve the quality of our workforce, but uh, we have an educated workforce. We uh, look for ways to remove barriers to business being successful in our community. We work closely with the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance and the Governor's Office for Economic Development to, to provide incentives and opportunities for businesses and we have a, a pretty robust economic development department at the city of Henderson as well that helps to uh, walk people through the process to be able to bring their business to our community. And we'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of the businesses you've brought in. You've done Thank a you. very good job on that. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about livability though. Uh, back to the community survey, 90% of residents 
uh, value and and are very satisfied with the recreation opportunities you have. Yes. You are abundant. You have a huge network of trails. 64 parks, 134 miles of trails. And a lot of programs too. And Let's not forget that. The recreation programs yes. too. After school and before school programs for right. kids. Lots of things going on in Henderson. Why is it so important for a, for a city to have that type of infrastructure? Well I think that's part of the whole quality of life, the fabric of our community, that this is a great place to live, work and play and that families are welcome and that the the door is always open to, to folks in our neighborhoods. We're even looking at uh, after school homework zones in our parks and rec facilities. So we've wired up all of our facilities so that after school, if a, if a kid has, uh, needs to go somewhere to do their homework, that we can, uh, our facilities are wired up so that these kids have a place to do their homework. I want to ask you a question about budgeting too. So when you're looking at something like your parks and rec department, let's say, and obviously there's a lot of upkeep, you have so many trails and things like that. Mm -hmm. When you're in the budgeting process, can you give us a little bit of insight of exactly how that works at the city level when you're, when you're maybe taking other services, but then you're also taking such a big infrastructure that you have in recreation and budgeting those? How does that work? Well, you, you have to set your strategic priorities. So, and we have, as a city, we've sit, sat down and we've done strategic planning. We've set those priorities. We have uh, some of the best department heads in each of the departments, and obviously we have a, a Parks and Rec uh, director, and then we also have an infrastructure assistant city manager that work together in setting the goals and the priorities and where those resources should be targeted. And, and we look at things like efficiencies, for example, uh, looking at ways that we can more efficiently use water so that we can reduce the consumption of water, but also uh, save money at the same time and, and also be more conservative in that use of water. So there's things that we do to look at our performance and measure our performance in many different areas and to be more efficient. Maybe maybe it's even having a couple of parks under a particular park maintenance person instead of maybe one park per person. We, we look at what the span of control might be and trying to be more efficient in the use of resources. We actually have a, um, a lower a citizen to employee ratio than any of the municipalities with the exception of North Las Vegas. Hmm. And then, is are those decisions that happening at the city council level, or is that the is that the the management team that's making those decisions? You know, there, there's input that's provided from the the mayor and council to for policy, and then it's up to the city manager, who's the chief operating officer. So I kind of liken it to, um, say, the mayor and council being the CEO and the board of the city and then the operating officer, the chief operating officer would be the city manager and his team who are really the implementers and the, and the program folks that, that get the job done. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the improvement areas for the community survey. Crime was one of them, uh, that, and this is public opinion, but public opinion was had a decrease in, in crime rates, mm -hmm. uh, at least by their perception, and then one of the areas for improvement was increased crime prevention. What is the city doing to make sure that residents' perception is that crime is being addressed? And I think crime came in at 80%, so it really wasn't a, a bad statistic, but it, was, it certainly wasn't 100%, it wasn't the 98% citizen satisfaction. But one of the things that, that we've done in the last year is we've added 46 new officers to the street. We also have a, a community-oriented policing strategy that looks at data-driven solutions. So our chief of police is working with her team, and they're looking at data and statistics, like what corners are most of the accidents occurring, that maybe that's where you target resources during particular hours when you know that certain accidents might occur. Or if there's crimes occurring in particular areas, say after school, kids uh, you know, jiggling handles on cars, that maybe that's where our police officers are targeted. And our officers today are actually working neighborhoods and getting to know the stores and the restaurants and the businesses in the neighborhood they go in. And, and so they know, they have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the business owners and the homeowners in that area as well. So we're doing more to be more engaged and, and hopefully having our residents be the eyes and our businesses be the eyes and ears for the city. Homicide rates at North Las Vegas and, and Henderson both saw record record numbers of homicides from previous years. Is that a similar situation where it's pocketed in certain communities that you're really addressing now, or, or how, how is the city addressing the homicide rate? Well, I think just having more officers out on the street and using data-driven solutions to make sure that if there's if there's trends that are occurring, what's causing them? Is it drug-related? Is it is it family domestic violence? If it's domestic violence, sometimes you, you have no way of predicting where that might occur. But certainly there's predictors if you know that there's places where maybe a drug transaction might be occurring. So it's how we are using that data to be able to identify and make sure that we have officers in the right places at the right times. 
Population growth yes. is projected to grow considerably in Henderson. The Wall Street Journal just did an article mm -hmm. uh, that really talked about a big, big influx of Californians that are moving moving to Henderson. How is the city preparing for this growth? And I, I just want to put it in, in, in numbers. We're looking, if I'm understanding it correctly, projection of about 100,000, and that's and that's about a, almost a third of your population now mm -hmm. to almost about 400,000. Is that mm -hmm. correct? In the next 20 years. Yeah. So yeah. What, what's the city? What's the city doing? You know, to plan I think we're that? being strategic and and thoughtful. In in the decisions that we're making and we we certainly have a comprehensive plan that looks at how we're developing our community and where certain uses should be in our community and making sure that we've got adequate roadways and infrastructure to accommodate that growth in the future but then also um, we have a, a strategic plan that targets those priorities that we talked about, those five pillars. And then we have a smart cities plan that looks at how we use technology and resources to be more efficient when maybe we don't have more manpower. We can certainly do things like a uh, 911 operator can trigger lights to allow for emergency response vehicles, whether it's police or fire, to be able to respond quickly, which allows us in Henderson to, to uh, really be record-breaking in terms of cardiac and, and uh, stroke survivability in uh, the country. We're, we're leading the country in that area. And back to the community so, survey, I know you, the, the city scored very, very high in responsiveness for both police and fire, yes. one of the big areas. And let's just touch upon that really quick. You have your own fire, you have your own police, you're not using county services. Response times are obviously one reason of that. Are there other reasons why it's beneficial to have your own your own police and fire? You know, we again, it comes back to that survivability as well. We our police and fire uh, train together on many things like emergency response, and so often the police department arrives before the fire department, and they're able to start emergency medical response before the fire department gets there. As soon as the fire department arrives, they take over. Our fire department actually transports where uh, the county and uh, the city of Las Vegas don't transport their their patients and so we transport and I think that leads to a lot of the reason why we are, are excelling in cardiac and stroke survivability as well. And Henderson definitely has a, a great uh, set of hospitals as well. Yes yeah. we do. Thank you. Let's let's move to economic development yes. then too another big piece of, of where growth's going right and let's start with let's start with Google and the data center a huge win Yes, I think the governor said a landmark win for, yes. for the city. Uh, for one thing, what is the data center, and can you put in some context of you know does every city have a data center, no, or is this something no. that's very unique? There are only 13 data centers in the world. Six are in the United States, and one of them is now in the city of Henderson, and and they manage Gmail, uh, YouTube, and I think uh, Google Maps will be operated out of this location. So there's a lot of things that will be happening out of Henderson as a, as a result of this service being there. And they're making a $600 million investment and expected to have uh, 200 jobs at $65,000 a year. Those are good paying jobs which in I'm, our community. Yes. Which I'm assuming you're, you're hoping those residents will be living in Henderson as well. Absolutely. I'm wondering economic drivers beyond that. Do you foresee the Google Data Center coming in really having a benefit for the economy of Henderson? And in general beyond just the what they're investing in. Absolutely. I think that you'll see more good paying jobs coming in. You'll see jobs that support the Google operation folks moving into the area as well and with their families. So you'll be bringing more um, educated workforce and, and folks who are able to work in that industry uh, in our community as well. And let's talk about that too because I know a lot of the uh, the tech companies, the big tech companies, they like to cluster. Yes. One comes and then many come. Is there anything in the works that you've heard of or you that, there may that be. might be? Might be. I but I can't, can't say anything about yet. It. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on to the Raiders then. The yes. Raiders is another big one. Headquarters is coming to Henderson. Yes. What what does that do? It's completely separate than than Google when you have a team coming in, but is it the same for economic driving, or do you see that something like the Raiders can build the economy in, in different ways? Oh, I think that there'll probably be more uh, tourism around that facility where folks will come in to want to see a practice. And uh, and to have the corporate headquarters and practice fields is, is an exciting coup. I, I'm glad we don't have the traffic of, of the uh, larger stadium in our city, that we don't have to contend with the, the amounts of traffic that they're going to have on game days. But we're going to have the Raiders every day in the city of Henderson. And, and we're excited that they've called Henderson their home. 
they're making a significant investment in our community. They, they originally, when they came in, they said that they'd be making a, a $75 million investment in that facility, and I understand that it's more like a $150 million investment that they're making in Henderson as well. So uh, not only are we going to see their 250 employees that are coming in, but that our hope is that a lot of the players and, and retired players, folks who want to be around the Raider community, coming into our community as well and being a part of the fabric of, of Henderson. Now, Golden Knights, and this is contingent on on, uh, on wins, so let's keep that in mind. But the Golden Knights, the, their practice facilities have seen a huge influx of mm -hmm. residents coming in and watching, and and, yes. and they've had to manage traffic and, and, and things like that. Is the city prepared to potentially have the same thing happen with the Raiders and have people from all over the valley coming to watch them practice? And actually, the, where the Raiders are located is right next to the Henderson Executive Airport, and I anticipate that there'll be folks even flying in to the Henderson Executive Airport and then coming across to to watch a practice as well. And I, I do think we'll see some tourism as a result of that, absolutely. I'm wondering, at the city council level again, when you have something like the Raiders, I, I'm just gonna assume there's not a lot of opposition that happens within city council or maybe leadership of a city when you have that type of potential boon to your economy. But I'm also wondering, well, for one thing, is, is that true? Or, or has there, was there opposition? Has there been opposition to that, um, to Raiders coming into the I didn't the city? see opposition to the Raiders. And, and what happens is staff briefs, they come in and brief with uh, council members and the mayor. Um, we also have uh, briefings from the developer who's building the facility and from the Raiders folks who would come in and, and brief. So I think that the city council had a, a pretty good level of comfort uh, that this was a solid project, that they were making a significant investment, and that their investment would have economic impacts for our community. In fact, a um, short time after this facility was approved, we saw a piece of land that the city sold at auction that sold for a million dollars an acre. So that, that had definitely had some significant impact on the property values in the area. It was well. adjacent to where the headquarters is? It was is not far. It was within a mile, yeah. Let, since we're talking about lack of land acquisition, let's talk about the, the most recent land acquisition. Yes. Uh, $27 million uh, acquisition, I believe. Haas Automation is yes. coming, California-based company moving here and building uh, manufacturing tools, yes. I, I, I believe. Yes, right? and high-tech tools. You know, I had a conversation the other day with Don Ahern at Ahern Reynolds, and he uses Haas equipment to build his, the equipment that he uses to uh, scissor equipment, scissor trucks, and and all sorts of equipment that he uses in his operation. So to see that many different uh, folks who are involved in manufacturing actually use the Haas automation equipment and, as and well. I, I want to talk about scope here. I understand here. they export actually to 60 different countries, hmm. the Haas, which is awesome. And, the, and this is a big facility. This is 2.3 million square feet that they're yes. going to be building here. And at build out, it's expected they'll have 2,500 jobs in the community. So statewide manufacturing is one of our big areas. It's an in-demand sector, and we expect it to grow a lot. Why is it a good fit for Henderson with your infrastructure and your economy? You know, planning for the future um, and knowing that we're creating jobs that will stabilize us into the future, you know, during the economic downturn, we saw um, a significant uh, unemployment and some challenges because we weren't a diverse economy. And certainly having a high-tech manufacturing company in our community will certainly diversify that, and especially a company that exports to 60 other countries, so so you're seeing more stability in the marketplace. Um, obviously, we're working with uh, and will be working with Haas to make sure that we're creating an educated workforce so that we uh, can go ahead and have have the training that's necessary in our schools, our, in our high schools, and in our colleges to have uh, the, their equipment in in those facilities and trained on that equipment as well. And how does that work at the city level then? When you're, do you negotiate directly with Haas Automotive to make sure that when they're coming into the city, they are bringing, uh, you know, training or some form of support for their workforce or is, or... Yeah. Well, we actually had three companies bid on that property and part of their development proposal included a whole strategy about how they would come in and educate uh, the workforce and that their plan was to do community outreach and community education as well. Let's talk a little bit about downtown redevelopment. Yes. It's kind of a, a mixture of the livability and the economic development pieces we've been talking about. What's going on in, in on Water Street in downtown? Some wonderful things. In the last year, we've seen 10 new companies, come, uh, different businesses come into Water Street. And of course, Juan's Flaming Fajita, uh, Juan and Darcy, uh, Vasquez invested $2.3 million in their Juan's Flaming Fajita facility. And I have to tell you, if you haven't been down there, there's a, a like a half hour wait 
to, to get into that restaurant. To, I, I have not, and I have to ask, is this just, this is a restaurant, or is this This is a, a restaurant on Water Street, so it's exciting, and, and I would encourage folks to, to try their food. It's amazing. And, and, and I know there's been, there's been 10 new businesses yes. that have developed, that have storefronts there. What are some of the other businesses that are coming well, into downtown? Well, we had downtown? a chicken and pizza restaurant and different, different uh, businesses at different levels, like uh, small business, doctor's offices, things like that. Golden Knights might be coming. Yes. I, I stress might because the city council approved just to start negotiations. Yes, we've entered into an exclusive negotiating agreement with the Golden Knights uh, to uh, move into the site that would be where our Henderson Convention Center is currently located. And um, if uh, we enter into an agreement to move forward. You could see that facility raised in a new facility similar to the city national facility that you see in Summerlin, um, built in the downtown Henderson area as well. And right now, 30% of the traffic that goes over to Summerlin comes from Henderson. So this really is meeting a niche, and I believe that the uh, Golden Knights want to expand their market into uh, to a greater extent into Henderson. And part of uh, the agreement that we would be proposing is that youth from our community would have the opportunity to use facilities there. Um, so we would have parks and rec programs uh, occurring within their facility. Uh, they would have a restaurant uh, with bar like they do out in City National and, and very similar operation to what they have in City National and they would operate the facility. You mentioned youth. Let's let's go to education. This is something I find very interesting that the city of Henderson does. City of Henderson has no jurisdiction over the district necessarily with the schools, but yet the city is doing a lot to support local schools. What are some of the things the city's doing? You know, we actually have many grants that we give to schools, and, and uh, I know this next year we're looking at over a uh, million dollars in grants that we're going to be funding to schools. Money from those comes from the redevelopment dollars, uh, the 18% set aside in redevelopment that goes to education. We're using those monies for uh, mini grants into schools. We're also using 30% uh, of the marijuana revenue that comes into the city of Henderson is directed towards education. We believe it's important for us to move the needle to get better outcomes, to see more success for our children in our community. And we want better outcomes, so it's incumbent upon us to, to uh, be behind that and, and in fact I know as we did our community outreach not only through Southern Nevada Strong but also through our Henderson Strong comprehensive plan one of the top issues uh, in our community was for education in fact the number one issue that we heard from our residents in Henderson was education and improving outcomes for children in our community so we're doing things like that the mini grants we've uh, also got the mayor's honor roll where we acknowledge and, and recognize contributions uh, of teachers and students and uh, administrators, folks who are making a difference and having an impact on our community. So we acknowledge those accomplishments and, and we support different programming across uh, Henderson uh, through our Community Education Advisory Board, which is a 15 member board in Henderson that uh, supports education. I want to come back to, to tying in education with marijuana money. I think this is fascinating because at the state level, this is be, being talked about right now in legislation. Governor Sisolak uh, prominently talked about this in his State of the State address about marijuana money being directed towards educational at a statewide level. I didn't know a city had any type of jurisdiction over that money as well. How is revenue, how is revenue uh, being used for education at the local level there? Well, we, that revenue comes into our general fund and a third of it will will go to education funding. So we, we've given grants already using this money in our community. That It's really important for us to see this money reach the kids and reach the schools. And we've provided things like Chromebooks to schools. We actually have provided, in some schools, social workers where they felt that the greatest need was to provide services and support to at-risk children in their community. So there's different places where those dollars make a difference. It could go to a robotics program. It could go to improving outcomes in a classroom. Room. And um, there's many different programs and services. We're using some of the money, I think, to uh, make sure that we've wired all of our rec facilities for, for homework opportunities for children to go after school. If they don't have internet at their homes, to make sure that, that there's internet available for them to do their homework. So, Mayor March, we're, we're almost out of time. I want to I give you this, this question. 
for uh, residents that are that are in in Henderson now and for future residents we've talked about a lot of things here but what's that one takeaway you want residents to really understand about the city or you personally what's the one thing that is you think the the essence of what Henderson is you know I want our residents to love Henderson as much as I and I know our council and our city employees love Henderson it's a great place to live work and play and we have a wonderful quality of life and and I see that resonating up and down the city hall I see uh, the elected officials passionate about good outcomes. I see the employees doing great things. And uh, I see that the folks that they run into on the street, whether it's the police officer or the Parks and Rec employee, that, that they love Henderson and that they're committed to serving. And I think that's hopefully what you see when you when you come into the city of Henderson. Well, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. We, I think we covered, we covered the, the gamut of, of the city. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, as always, for joining our discussion on Nevada Week. For resources discussed on this show or for more information, we encourage you to visit our website. Also, if you have a topic or issue you'd like us to explore on Nevada Week, we would love to hear from you. So please find us on social media or email us at nevadaweek at vegaspbs.org. Thank you again, and I'll see you on the next Nevada Week.